Welcome. This is the February 29th Beehive Production User Call. We have Chris, Andrew, Jan, John, and myself, Michael. And I will throw out there that Beehive a ARM64 support, I often brain fart those, 64 support is arriving. And you can load vmm.ko on certain hardware, including my ancient Thunder X machine, but the user land tools have not arrived. I am guilty of refreshing the Seagit tree to the Beehive <clears throat> user space component like every few hours. So, uh, Chris, it sounds like you have a report on storage backend performance. Right. So I started to um, basically set up a virtual machine with uh, a memory, uh, a RAM disk as a backing storage, and then tried different kinds of backends as a IO block and NVMe. And I want to expand it to basically almost all the different kind of variations that we have AHCI and uh, I don't know what else is there. Um, and the results that I'm seeing is interesting enough to warrant the conversation, I think. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm thinking of expanding the whole work into you know uh, a scripted environment that uh, I would like to share. So we can actually run it on different types of CPUs and different kinds of systems as well with different kinds of RAMs to just compare whether this is just a fluke on my end that I'm seeing or if the results are actually truly what I'm seeing. Uh, I'm using uh, Bonnie Plus Plus to do the measurements and I'm actually running, uh, let me think, I think like 32 runs and uh, I started an R script to bring everything together and um, I'm planning to do uh, nice diagrams to, you know, make it understandable on, on a cursory glance also what's going on. The results that I'm seeing at the moment are actually showing that NVMe is slightly slower for the workload that the uh, that Bonnie Plus Plus is doing. Uh, it's slightly slower than Vert IO. Probably to be expected. Um, I'm not 100% sure. On the other hand, um, maybe my setup is not the best. And that is why I would like actually like to ask your opinion on, on my setup. At the moment, I set up the system. Uh, it's a guest with, I think, two gigs of RAM. And the RAM disk at the moment is, I think, 12 or 16 gigabytes um, in size. So it is definitely larger, the disk is larger than the RAM of the virtual guest to ensure that we're not just looking at the cache. Nonetheless, um, I'm wondering, is Bonnie Plus Plus the right tool to, to measure? And how many measurement runs should I actually be doing? I guess, I mean, I can look at that from a statistical standpoint. And I think I could probably even do more, but eventually um, a, a number of units, it's just statistically significant. And uh, I expect the results not change much. But, when you um, say 32 runs, of, do you mean in sequence or parallel? That is exactly, ah, that's also a good point. I'm, I want to do both. Um, I've started doing both. I've, I've run, um, I've run single, uh, single runs, 32 in sequence. And I started running, I think four. Yeah, I ran I, I pick up because I gave it four uh, four BCPUs and I ran four uh, concurrent runs 32 times as well. And the results are still consistent that NVMe is slightly slower, less throughput than Verdio. You've buried the lead. What guest OS? Uh, FreeBSD, sorry. Okay, sure. And that that I think is what might help under uh, explain the narrative difference between NVMe being so good on Windows and uh, Vertio working better on FreeBSD in so far as either one has mm -hmm. a more mature driver, probably in both cases in different ways. So yeah, this kind of work is exactly what's needed to shine light on that. Yeah, I was thinking, you know, if I do this right, then we can quite easily get comparable data for, well, let's say, a FreeBSD guest and a Linux guest. Exactly. And um, the question is, I don't, I'm, I'm not even certain. Is there Bonnie Plus Plus on Windows? I haven't checked actually. Or maybe with Sigwin or something. I'm, I want to interject here. There's a mailing list thread that's been popping up that's about somebody having 
guest disk performance issues. Are you involved in that thread or? No, nah, I just read it. I was, I was thinking about posting something, but I kept okay. my fingers out of that one. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Rod. And that said, uh, FIO is one of the kind of gold standards on this topic. And the, the, the narrative is that you can model a workload and reproducibly throw it at things. But I have not found, found that miracle archive of hundreds of different workloads from over the years. But I, I, after this call, I'll share what I've got to do similar things in my little scripts. Um. Is Bonnie++ friendly with graphing? You mentioned graphing, and for what it's worth, Fio sprouted a JSON output, which can be quite handy. It, it just drops CSV, and um, I'm actually, I have an R script um, that just pulls in the CSV, and, you know, R is perfect for that because it's statistics work. And I'm, uh, I'm then basically converting the data tables in R into uh, some graphics. That, that's, that's generally the gist of it. Well, <clears throat> uh, Godspeed on that, and I'm happy to help because I've run similar tests and, for example, just create four devices at once and test them pretty much all at once, but watch your caches, uh, not in parallel, but the resources are cheap when they're virtualized. Um, any questions for Chris on that? And perhaps, John, any thoughts on what to watch for? Because maybe you've got something in your workflow that might want to be explained. Well, the one thing I would uh, ask or at least comment on, um, first of all, excellent. Uh, this is, it's great work. Um, Michael made a comment. I do tend to use FIO also, not Bonnie. Um, when you are running your VM, especially when you're running with uh, memory, uh, <clears throat> are you uh, locking down your, are you pinning your CPUs? So whether you do it with the dash P option of Beehive or um, you can do a, uh, what I tend to do is you can use Procstat and you can give it the PID of your Beehive uh, VM and it will come out and uh, with the appropriate options, it will spit out all of the threads that Beehive, Beehive has started and you can determine which of those threads are your virtual I.O. threads, uh, which of those threads belong to other aspects of the VM, and you can then lock them down appropriately. I don't know if you're running in a NUMA machine or whatnot, but it can uh, make a vast difference in your performance depending upon where the memory is coming from that you're allocating versus what uh, CPUs uh, you're using and pinning to. That is a very good point. Yeah, that is a very good point. Actually, I did not think about that thing. Is this a single socket machine? It is a single socket. Okay, that machine. that that helps yes. eliminate the NUMA architecture problem. Not for all uh, potential systems. For example, big enough uh, Intel systems uh, and early uh, Epics may report as NUMA on a single socket. Uh, because that is closer to the real topology on die. For example, worst offender in that regard is first generation Epic, where your socket is basically a four node NUMA system of four identical dice in one uh, package with individual memory controllers and no shared last level cache. Yeah, in my instance, it's just the Ryzen 7 something, I believe, if I'm not. Uh, if it's a Ryzen, it shouldn't be too bad. At most, you have two computers and a shared last level cache. But if it's a Ryzen, you have another problem. Uh, and that is uh, these things normally do a uh, firmware slash hardware based frequency uh, adjustment. So uh, even if you don't run power D, uh, the just the whatever, probably the management coprocessor will do automatic uh, frequency uh, scaling with load uh, to enable it to turbo. The problem is FreeBSD doesn't have a frequency aware scheduler. So that can prevent it from turboing too high because it will never completely unload uh, unutilized cores. 
so that uh, you get the best boost behavior and it doesn't prefer the uh, fastest one or two uh, cores per compute die. But for most workloads, that's not too much of a problem. But for benchmarking, the problem is that you are not in control of frequency unless you take over at runtime or configure to a fixed frequency in the firmware, so UEFI or BIOS, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but uh, for most chips, TurboStat yeah. can at least uh, look at the basic frequency and power uh, data for Ryzen chips. OK, Thank that's you, uh, one more reason, I guess. I sh I'm actually thinking of running this whole thing also on, in on an Intel 13. So um, I guess one oh. more reason to compare that. Uh, Intel 14th gen with or with our 13th, 13th, uh, 13th, sorry, 13th. 13th gen. So uh, anything past 12, uh, you have potentially different types of cores. I have different cores. Yeah, I understand that. I would I would pin that to the um, to the performance cores. Yeah. Because otherwise you're playing total lottery. <laughs> so even with hyper threading enabled, you can look at the uh, sys control that maps out the uh, the CPU information, the CPU cores, and you can map. Uh, beehive to only to not run on hyperthread partners. And what's a sys controller? Could you look it up? Oh, um, that would a topology be... or something. Kern dot chat dot topology or something. Yeah, I never. I don't know what it is off the top of my head. Hang on a second. No worries. Uh, a topology spec. Uh, yes, that's that's it right there. That's the. Uh... Thank you. Appreciate it's only it. presented to uh, user space as um, XML, but the kernel doesn't have to pass it, only emit it. Uh, so it's just a few loops of nested printfs hmm. to emit that once. Yeah. Nice. Uh, Chris, I'll show it. Is. I'll throw it out there, having gone down this road and poked this beast. Uh, I, I live and die by ZFS, but feel free to boot to a UFS booted VM just so you're not having all those arc surprises and other caching issues. And maybe there are ways, Rod, you might know to even crank down whatever caching is in UFS to a bare minimum. And uh, of course, in all things T CPU and topology related, consider disabling hyperthreading, which may have its own um, uh, adventurous um, Changes. So my VM, my guess is is UFS. Yeah, Good. it is UFS. Oh. Um, another thing to play with is if you have hyper threading, maybe you don't want to use it across guests, but it can still provide an advantage. So it can also make sense to allocate uh, both hyper threads of a physical core to a single guest, so that you always treat them as pairs. That way. Uh, the guest doesn't get to attack other guests, only itself and the hypervisor. I, I would strongly encourage for any benchmarking work to purely turn off hyperthreading. Just turn it off in the bio. Yeah, just set the CDL and we- Only way you're going to get consistent results. Do you really have to go into do a BIOS for that? Isn't it enough to just set the uh, loader tunable to disable it in the scheduler? Not sure. In so theory, yes. Yeah. If you, if you turn it off in the BIOS, it's literally turned off in the chip by a by a um, uh, MSR. Yeah, if you turn it off in BIOS, it's definitely off. So I may be getting a little bit farther down the road than than you want to hear, Chris. But one of the other things you can do, um, and I know you're using Bonnie, but with FIO. Um, you, if you're testing parallel runs, so maybe you have, maybe you're testing with four data files, uh, you know, data one through data four, whatever. Um, one of the things you'll, you can also test is, uh, actually creating four separate mount points. Okay. So, you know, slash, slash data one, slash data two, slash data three, slash data four, and put your, uh, data file into each of those mount points, which is then a separate device to uh, Beehive going back to the hypervisor. 
you will find that your performance is different. You're, and you'll get you will get better throughput. But that would also entail having a different uh, backing device for each of those mount points, right? Well, that's where life gets really, really interesting. Um, to be absolutely blunt, and you know, I for whatever it's worth, I do this kind of thing where I actually have dedicated NVMe devices that I pass in as separate data devices that we then put our our data on for access to get the best performance off of it. But you are absolutely correct. But you will, if you put them all onto the same uh, device at the hypervisor level, then yes, all of a sudden the tuning of that device uh, comes into play very much. Um, as, as I typically go to management and, and say, it's all a question of how much money do you want to spend for how much performance? John, do you have a favorite set of FIO scripts that you have permission to share? Um, I will happily go look. I'm not, I don't have something that I can just immediately throw at you. Actually, I may have something I can share here right now. Other suggestions for Chris, who is doing Rod's work, as they say? Um, does FIO support uh, accessing the block devices directly uh, without a file system in between, just writing to- Yes, it does. It devices, absolutely does, yes. Because that would avoid any file system caching problems. Right, exactly. That's actually something that I was kind of, um, that was kind of bugging with Bonnie Plus Plus because you cannot do that on uh, on, on Bonnie Plus Plus. Um, the next problem is uh, potentially if you're going all the way down to that level and use the uh, CAM uh, API, if supported, you can actually control QDAP uh, from user space, which is something you can do with CAMDD, uh, which does use that. It's basically a DD written for only uh, CAM devices, which is most devices now that uh, NVMe uh, also uses a CAM driver. And um, the nice thing about that is that, for example, you can do a DD with a buffer size and QDEP, so you don't have to use a ridiculous block size. Instead, you can say, I want like 128 kilobyte blocks and 32 uh, uh, QDEP, and then it will do that, and your SATA SSD will finally hit its uh, data sheet numbers for once, but it's a very unrealistic workload but maybe a useful uh, micro benchmark. We've been mentioning various caching uh, things happening here and just an oddball, the oddball comment. One of the things I like about using the separate mount points um, or a separate mount point from the OS, um, you can unmount and remount uh, that device between runs which causes a full flush from the, at least the OS layer. That doesn't necessarily cause a full flush at the hypervisor layer, which is a, a totally separate issue. And depending on what kind of driver, it also doesn't do a block level flush. So if you're, for example, using a hardware rate controller, it will not flush its uh, inferiorly stable cache. Um, but it will flush any file system cache, which is mm -hmm. all you can do as a guest operating system. So Chris, having gone down this road, I created this little framework that you can use, which indeed as to your point, Jan has a choice and on different OSs, it works on Lumos, on Linux and FreeBSD. Um, I've, added this notion of raw and character devices for those OSs that support the different ones. Um, this, there's a bunch of blood, sweat, and tears in this, so I encourage you to take a look, and you can throw pro bio profiles at it. So if John comes up with, up with a profile, you can just feed it directly into this uh, contraption. All right, thanks. Michael, one of the things you kind of mentioned earlier, plus it shows up in your 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 stuff here, Yes. Um, 
how how much difference do you see between operating systems? Oh boy, um, and yeah, uh, I know that's a dirty question. Go check out my my uh, of Open ZFS Developer Summit talk on exactly that because yeah, it's of course a can of worms, but um, <laughs> especially now that we have you know Open ZFS on NetBSD, Windows, Mac, you name it, Linux. Um, so I. Did not see a few years back a you know a major like leader there. I know in practice FreeBSD when you're talking like 100 gig networking is often outperforming Linux on the same hardware. So I've diagnosed that in the real world. Um, I think this we've all in our different ways scratched the surface of this uh, this uh, massive important beast. And so, Chris, keep at it. Let's each help you as best we can. And here's my little contribution. Go ahead and jump into that, throw some profiles at it. And you can, this initially came from me trying to determine SAS expander overhead. That is, a SAS channel has four channels to four disks, and then you can take one cable and magically control 102 disks or more, but that can't possibly not have overhead in my book. So I set this up to run parallel FIO jobs against all of uh, the participating disks. And even on a humble older like Dell SAS2 JBOD, I saw up to like 12% overhead on the older JBOD. Some of them are a lot more efficient than others, but uh, that's the kind of science that can only be answered by sitting down and do doing it and documenting your work to distinguish it from just tinkering around in the um, lab. So since you went down that road, I have to ask you the Please. question. Do you also do any testing? Um, because I have, I've run the exact same test you're talking about, and I've, but I've also found that there are a lot of disk drives that do not like being used on their A and B channel simultaneously. Oh yes, Toshiba on from BSD, <laughs> whereas no, on not and Lumos might be happy celebration land. Um, so and, yeah, and no. I, I'm sorry, I had to ask that question because I, I, yeah, you're 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 bringing back an awful lot of memories. Exactly. No, uh, I, 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 and IX Systems concluded that um, multipath SaaS is solving several aggressively solving several problems we don't have and creating a dozen more in place of that. So, yeah, there's no place for it in my workloads. And for what, for better, for worse, the FreeBSD kernel and its implementation don't have some miraculous performance-oriented multipass SAS to the best of my knowledge. So, yeah, just, uh, yeah, no. But I'm welcome to hear what others have to say. So what do you mean by multipathing? Because if you have uh, an expander, you, of course, want to use more than one SAS lane to it. Oh. But that I... should be transparent uh, to the kernel, more or less. Um so that you can put your ex both four lane uh, upstream ports of your expander into the same HBA and you won't see the disks twice so that oh. you don't have to deal with it in software. Uh, right, but are we talking that little extra few blocks at the end of the partition table to make no, to uh, show its talking, membership, uh, et cetera, et cetera? Making sure that you have enough bandwidth to a big J board to uh, come close to its sequ potential sequential throughput. Uh, if One, you have syntax, I'm sure lane. John and I would love to see it, but uh, uh, I the, think it sounds like we both have more scars than we do have uh, party. This is a cabling hangovers. question, more or less, not a config software configuration question. It's normally when you follow the high availability route behind SAS multipathing, mm -hmm. you end up with at least two host bus adapters and each upstream port uh, of each expander plugged into two different HPAs normally. Correct. So you have two upstream ports. Yes, I am. And then I you see everything agree. at least double, unless you have enough components to shoot yourself in the foot even more thoroughly, and you uh, wire it up as a ring, then you get interesting behavior. But um, the simple thing is if you, this can be used with geomultipathing in FreeBSD, and there is a, 
an old bug report of mine, which has never been properly fixed, but still, uh, because it's a design flaw in GM Multipath. So um, you don't have to deal that with that because you can define what it has and doesn't actually error out and pass it up. Exactly. Where, what, what happens is that because GM Multipath is at the wrong place in the IO stack, uh, it doesn't really see a difference between a link and a medium error. <laughs> so what that means is it uh, through the API, at least the APIs it uses, it doesn't or can't see the difference between having a bad block and having a failed link because it only gets a report telling it, yeah, uh, unrecoverable read or write error. Uh, so it tries the other path and then disables the failed one unconditionally. And um, yeah, when it has disabled all paths, it just re-enables them all and tries again. And yeah, you, have, you have rest... to write a, a separate standalone monitor program to look for that and then a report um, and error. Yeah, you, if I remember correctly, you do get DevCTL messages. Uh, so you could just use DevD, uh, uh, but you probably want to monitor that. No, I I, mo I monitor for the error messages, and when I see a loop, when it loops out twice, um, I will then take that G multipath entity and rem and remove it from the pool that it's in. Um, and That's the usually rest, one of the. Go ahead. The worst fuck up I uh, have encountered was. Uh, a disk with an unrecoverable read error in the primary partition table of the GPT formatted disk. So at the beginning of the disk, which meant that G Multipath successfully tasted the disk and then G label uh, or G part uh, tried to taste it and couldn't. And that just blocked the system during boot because it retried in an infinite amount of time. The system yep. was stuck for two days and just kept spamming. Uh, read link failed, second link failed, no links left, re enabling links. Yeah. Uh, while trying to taste the disks. And the only way to boot the system was to boot without GR multiple. Then I got the error message. Uh, and yeah. Yeah, so like um, I said, it aggressively Chris, solves so certain for, problems. Uh, and... For the work you're doing, um, definitely am curious to see what you find. And you're hearing all kinds of stories of where you might end up someday. Um, now that's not the, yeah. Okay, uh, that's a nice idea. The other problem I've encountered a few years later when I gave it a try again was that G Multipath was one of the few no, uh, mostly trivial GMs, which hasn't been at least in FreeBSD 12 dot something. It wasn't uh, rewritten to, or changed to take advantage of direct dispatch. So all GM multipath IO goes through the GM up or down threads. It's GM multipath doesn't do a lot of work, but on a high core count, high discount system, it can still become a bottleneck because that threat is still a single thread and suddenly all IO has to go to this one thread, which may even bounce around. But um, I played around with just lying to the kernel that this, because it was a lab system after all, that yeah, because I couldn't see any reason why it shouldn't work, but uh, then it performed a lot better on that system. So it made the difference between one point seven and three point something gigabytes per second on lots of spinning disks. But uh, you couldn't no longer shut down the system because it was, would always uh, hang on shutdown. I torture tested it otherwise and didn't produce any IO errors, but it just, for some reason, it failed to shut down. Um, it would unmount the file system, sync them, and then hang. Um, which is an annoying state to debug. Because um, I ran out of that? time, I didn't go uh, further into that. So I assume that this hasn't been fixed. But coming back to why it isn't so much of a problem, it's that it's really, in my just experience, unlikely that you will have the kinds of errors 
uh, path level multipathing will protect you from. So the cadets are not that likely to be tripped over unless you do something stupid. And um, there isn't anything too complex in between. So yeah, it's quite unlikely that you will have the kind of path error this can uh, protect you from. That a single HPA dies, but not the other one. Most firmware issues will take out both uh, HPAs over time. And yeah, it is what it is. I think we've gone down that road adequately Sorry, far. Sorry, uh, just uh, bring it back. back uh, so yeah, Chris, you've been warned. Two, I've given you a sample IO script there and notice that I think in my finding a few years back, only POSIX AIO as an IO engine was available on all the platforms I was testing. Because suddenly if you have different platforms with completely different IO engines, you might be comparing apples to oranges, etc. Um, so anyway, Chris, good point. Uh, yes. Ending my rant, uh, what may be useful to benchmark is GM knob. Uh, because mm -hmm. that way you can inject, I uh, think, uh, latency to, as well as errors. Mm -hmm. Because there's a delay uh, milliseconds uh, setting. Milliseconds may be a bit too coarse, but uh, you can specify a delay probability and delays in millisecond so that you can actually measure more realistic performance without having to go through actual hardware. Like configure mm -hmm. one or two millisecond latency and see what changes. Mm. Because otherwise it's possible that you're benchmarking unrealistic locking conditions. Okay. Anything else? Last thoughts? We've exhausted that one. And Godspeed, Rodspeed, Chris. Yeah, the next problem is <laughs> uh, with POSIX AIO, it's possible that on Linux, uh, you get the terrible um, fake implementation from glibc, which is a badly implemented thread pool hmm. because you can't map the full POSIX async IO um, API on Linux IO submit, which is their async IO system call because it does things differently because it's basically only initially designed to port over the IREX behavior of uh, restricting uh, asynchronous I.O. to direct I.O. So to do direct I.O., you basically had to use initially XFS or this is X4 and maybe other file systems. Mm. And then you kind of have to do block size aligned direct I.O. So yeah, there are probably an application like Flame or so from the SGI days, which does use this, but other than that. Okay, memory lane, which I know John likes and Rod likes, but hey, let's, uh, Chris, hopefully that's enough for you to uh, tinker with for the next six oh, months. Oh, more than enough, thank you. Okay, cool. Uh, Chris, do you want to break or do you want to give us a brief update on the uh, Enterprise Working Group report that Greg shared just yesterday, was it? And you kindly forwarded. Right, so, um... Basically, there's been a bunch of news around the OCI and .NET work. I think that is definitely of interest. And particularly the, 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 the um, oh my God, I can't speak. Uh, the .NET uh, work actually allows us to continue a lot of work that depends on that. And uh, hmm. So there's, there's hope for, for example, for Samba, as far as I remember, that was also depending on uh, just oh. get updated because GitHub um, actions and the webhooks are depending on that, if I mm. rem remember correctly. And well, OCI, I think you're, we're, we're well involved anyways, because um, um, we even changed the, um, the, the settings of uh, the jail calls to, in, to include Doug. So I think you were, yeah, Doug's been great. Probably will brief on that anyways. Right. And otherwise, I think um, there is a couple things that uh, are kind of stalled, particularly, for example, OpenGDK, where we're still looking for a contractor. I understand that there was one candidate that was very promising, but unfortunately, that didn't pan out. 
I made an introduction and, yesterday or the day before, so hopefully that will get somewhere. Okay. Oh, that's good to hear. I didn't know about that. Perfect. Yeah, Greg has. Um, great. And yeah, otherwise, um, otherwise, I think that's it. Oh, um, what about the beehive parts? Not to bury that lead. <laughs> well, I think the beehive parts are basically what we have been talking about cool. all the time, okay. basically. I okay. just uh, summarized uh, the points that we've been talking about recently. My understanding, um, or my the way I'm looking at the situation right now is basically, I figure um, one of the insights that I had recently was, uh, I cannot remember who actually brought that point. Maybe it was Patrick who said it would be nice to have uh, beehive management work or at least a tooling set like uh, for jails. Uh, and I think that is a pretty nice perspective also with the understanding that keeping network management as a separate thing that is working with the existing tooling uh, because then the problem statement and the problem scope actually boils down to this, this tooling subset even though state management is still something that is of importance, but I think we now have this conversation, this call coming up for BMD, which is uh, very promising and very interesting. To also contrast that to what I started with we have state B. And yeah, the, there's been a bunch of documentation update on the handbook. There's been one iteration, there's a second iteration on the review. Um, actually, I can post the the link really quickly, maybe. If I think I I've got a link there. Let's take a look. Thank you so much for that. Uh, did I put it here? Yeah, even the man page update is, um, is on oh, the Wiki too? That is also just the first awesome. iteration. Yeah. Great. And thank you, Jan, for that bug report. The thing is, for normal I.O., it just increases the number of uh, retries. So if it happens during the normal operation of the system, it will, when it runs through all links, you know, multiple will just admit failure. Yeah, and not to change do... the subject, my, my bad yeah. for mentioning that, but let's, uh, I'll, I'll just put it in context there. And Chris, it sounds like you have some doc links. Let's see what you got. Yeah. Let's... And did I, yeah, so I'll bring up this point on the manual page. Thank you for that. Everyone is welcome to give that a read. Um, heck, let's see. And those are short enough to be the full visible URL. Uh, is this the same one or not? Let's see. 940 is there. Yeah, okay. Cool. Cool. Uh, I'll just let that link still do its job. Uh, anything else related to that, Chris? Um, that's it, I think. Cool. Uh, Jan, you gave us a great overview of your UCL macro work, I believe, on the jails call. Any news there? I didn't have time to work on that. Um, no worries at all. Anymore. Just to... Um, because we have a different group here, I can sketch out the idea. So um, when I looked at VMD, uh, sorry, at VM state D um, from Chris, um, I noticed that he had a little uh, UCL file for each uh, Beehive guest, and then you started from scratch every time, and you couldn't really share things easily, uh, whereas bigger applications for which uh, libucl was developed like aspmd the canonical example uh, use a single starting configuration and then uh, include everything uh, from there but the behavior especially relevant to the jails call which libucl doesn't directly support is that you want to basically include uh, stuff but then reference the file name of what you included into uh, the content about to be included. And I'm working to build a bit of an over uh, generalized uh, macro, which uh, includes a directory tree into the configuration. 
um, it does that by um, taking a directory as starting point, and then for each subdirectory uh, with the right kind of suffix, it will uh, create a new object in the configuration and uh, put the content found in that directory into this object. And the next step is that it will uh, also handle files in those directory. If they have one suffix, you can change the suffix. Uh, they get um, directly included into the current object, but you can also have them just like a directory get included into their own sub object. And then you have the ability to now take shared configuration snippets, write them manually or template them out once, and then just symlink to them. Uh, and we use uh, very small parts of your configuration so that changing, uh, basically enabling or disabling uh, something or adding something to each um, can just be, uh, hey, there's a um, symlink or remove a symlink. And that's um, yeah, what I want to enable. And to make it useful, you have to be able to reference, the, for example, the Beehive guest name. And I don't want to put that necessarily into the configuration. Instead, I um, wrote helper macros, uh, making it possible to set or configuration or so that you can basically set um, from inside your configuration, change the variables registered with the UCL parser so that you can just say set and then you give it a UCL snippet with and the top level keys in the configuration then become the variables uh, so that you can use the already available parser. Uh, you can control if the values passed from that get also stored in the object or not, or if they're only variables. And there's a macro to do the inverse operation, which can take a key from the current object and uh, import it as a variable. And the import can also scan up the tree so that you can control how far up the tree you want to scan. You can even control how, how early you want to start. So you can say, start at two nodes up and then start scanning or something um, so that you walk up the tree. And then you can reference that again. And you can decide if you want the things you can um, you set or important uh, to be treated as has to be a simple st a string value or it can be an object so or an array, which then means that you have quoting issues, but the default set macro just sets a string or string compatible value. And then there is define and export. So define defines variables containing objects so that you basically get, if you put a string in there, it's in double quotes and quoted. If you put an array in there, that, that it's really an array. Um, so you can then uh, use export, which is just uh, define, uh, but it also puts the things you configured uh, there into the current object. And set is just an export, which does the um, stuff, so it does the raw encoding. And all of that can be overridden, but so that you can don't have to pass annoying arguments every time there are three names for the same callback, which just set the three, in my opinion, useful defaults and anything else you can just override if you want. That said, uh, does it sound like Jan's on the right track there? So yeah, that's what I would like some feedback on if this, if anyone could follow my explanation or if I just was rambling away uh, and if it makes sense to you or if I'm building Vocalizing it crazy. is critical to you and eventually the rest of us. So I'm glad you did that. So it, when you have something to review, post it in the appropriate places. We're um, excited for lack of a better term. Anyone? So, anyway. Um, I have the first 
prototype where the include part worked, but the implementation used um, in internal APIs by redefining the exported symbols. And that's not what you're supposed to do. And it was uh, okay. very fragile. So uh, now I found a way to express what I need through the um, documented specified API uh, instead of having to uh, really clear internal functions, which is really nasty, but was a quick way to get it working initially. But it's also why- cool. Keep us posted. Yeah. I look forward to that. Um, so briefly, uh, let's talk events for two seconds. I see you've got, I can't imagine who put the thing in about Vienna, but the beloved Paul Vixie can't make it to BSD can as a mm, keynote speaker. Uh, if you have anyone perhaps in the mm, Chicago, Illinois area, etc., cetera, um, I'm all ears, someone who could drive up to Ottawa or who can fly in. But there's a little seed I'm planting. Uh, if anyone present here, John, do you want to give a big old keynote? I don't know. You've got some stories to tell. And uh, no, I was just I was just wondering. My uh, my wife is going to be in the Upper Peninsula, um, and I was I'm just I'm I'm need to look at dates. See if I could do something. I don't know. I don't cool. know. Uh, Chris, tell us about Open Source Summit Vienna. Yeah, so um, actually I only stumbled across that because Deb posted on that, uh, about that, and asked for anyone to submit a talk on FreeBSD. So um, I was looking at that. There's a bunch of topics that um, where we might probably fit something in. I was even thinking about submitting something myself, but... Um, Basically, if any one of you is interested and has something, then please, by all means, yeah. That is a few days before your OBSD con. Is that accurate? Yes, exactly. Okay. So you would all already be kind of close to, I think it's a double in your USD con. Yeah, Austria. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll throw it on the calendar here. Um, yes, I have a paper calendar. 16. Oh, as in like one day before. Yeah, okay, cool. cool. I think your biggest big cost starts at, hold on a second. The 19th, so uh, this is through the... 19th, 18th. yes, yeah. exactly. So you have have like, you been you to have one like, of these? Uh, nope. Okay, cool. But I heard that, um, I think this one is pretty large, actually, if I remember correctly. Cool. Okay, and you say, oh, the CFP is opening for Euro. Um, can we at least hear back from Ottawa first? I don't know. Okay, other topics. Anything else? That's We've certainly given Chris, you, a bucket of homework. Uh, Jan, you've got some coding work you're itching when you have a chance to scratch it. And um, John, if you've got any FIO to add to that list, I do have a little flag to just... Sure. Read in a file. I'll, 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 let I'll, rip. I'll, I will poke around. I have a. I want to take my my techie hat off for a second and Please. put my my management hat on. Ooh. And Jan was talking a lot about some very technical details, and I I don't disagree with him. But then I want to put my management hat on, and I, I wanted to talk about having the the tech is fine, but you know, going back to the to the working group for you know enterprise and stuff how many and this is just a simple example how many tools how many of our uh, allow us to specify which beehive executable to use and you'll note that i said something funny there i said which beehive executable right i don't and i'm i am definitely implying that there is more than one um, so we may have a test beehive executable on the system that we want to run a particular VM with. So at least in the databasing mechanism I have, we actually can specify the beehive executable as default, or we can actually specify the path to an alternate beehive executable for a particular target VM. The the number of disks that or the number of devices, I shouldn't really say disks, the number of devices that a, 
a VM can have needs to be a uh, some form of extensible list, not limited to you know one or two. Um, and does that handle pass through devices the same way it handles a a local device? Anyways, I just I'm trying to put on a different hat and just mention that these are issues that I've run into multiple times over the years. Um, and I, I think, Chris, I've made the comment to you, I support an environment where we actually can run, I can lay down the management processes we have on top of FreeBSD. I can lay the exact same management processes down on top of um, uh, Linux under for, and it supports a, a QEMU environment also. So it, it's, it's a, it's an interesting perspective uh, when you support both. How do you, how do you solve it technically, but also what are the requirements that are coming at a higher level from a management perspective? I'm hearing tech there. And from my weird perspective, I saw lots of choosing the specific beehive executable because, Hey, Peter and Neil were, probably pointing to dozens of them. So if you look at vmrun.sh, um, I'll move that link. Uh, it very much lets you specify those different components, if that's what you're referring to. If not, well, I, if it's more manage management, sure, you tell me. Well, if you have a loader equals dollar loader colon, you know, dash, and then a, a value that allows me to override it via ENV, that's one thing, but when mm -hmm. I'm talking about a user coming in from a web interface who simply wants to go into the config and he wants, they or he or she wants to use a, a any, a, I, they're the, the technical versus management. There's, sure. a, anyway, I don't know if I'm explaining it well. Yeah. The, um, I hear two levels. The one is a very narrow improvement uh, interpretation where please don't hardwire paths in your uh, code. So don't hardwire. I, the I totally agree. To, don't uh, hardwire. That, because <laughs> yeah. you shouldn't have to use hacks like change root uh, and nullfs or some links to uh, pe replace a single hardwired path in a processor's uh, uh, file system names or something. Uh, the other is make it easy to swap out paths, and there you get to. Okay, what's the, you're basically no longer calling a single executable and can have different versions of that, but now you've moved to uh, providing an API which potentially abstracts over different uh, implementations uh, because you can't just have a single command line which does anything useful and makes sense to QEMU and Beehive at the same time. Yeah, we recently talked about that, that you need an interval representation with different kinds of outputs. One that works for QEMU and the other one works for Beehive, for example. Yeah. And actually, that is you... something that I kind of started also with VMSTD because I have a separate representation and separate parsing that kind of translates the whole thing. And then technically speaking, it would be possible to have a translation for, for QEMU. Um, so, yeah. So the two points is... Either you can say, these are the hooks I invoke, and they have to do the thing I expect, which is a shell scripting level of abstraction, like this script here has to exec into the hypervisor. Mm -hmm. This script has to run to completion before the hypervisor is started. This one gets ran to completion after the hypervisor uh, finished and gets its access status or something like this. And then you can yeah. really define what the uh, arguments are, and they are not supposed to be the, directly the command line for the thing, but just a bunch of stuff. And for anything non-trivial, you probably want to define the environment variables, which then tell you what you want to learn, so that you don't have to pass it out of the command line arguments. Um, use the command line arguments to say which command you may want to invoke, and then but yeah, or you could put it all in the environment where works. Um, the other uh, level is you end up with something like libvirt, where you have a XML schema 
or set of XML schemas which define the configuration in syntax, and then you can use that to express it and how well it maps to the implementation and what is actually implemented differs between versions, implementations, backends, and what you can configure may depend on front end if your front end isn't an editor. <laughs> so yeah. There has been support, I think, for at least basic uh, stuff uh, in Libvir to run Pihive, but um, who wants to deal with uh, XML if you mostly care about a single hypervisor and don't have to, because Libvir isn't the friendliest of uh, interfaces. No, but so I agree with you, Jan, but let me come back with a kind of my management hat on. If you support a OpenStack environment with hundreds of hypervisors and you want to try to move uh, FreeBSD Beehive into that environment, you have to play the game. Of course. There's, there's, there is, you, there's no other, there's no other answer there. You, you have to be able to play by their rules and their API. Exactly. At that point, you're playing their game. And the question is how much is the ownership do you want of the product? And do you want to consume something or do you want to own something uh, that restricts what you can even consider? Michael, you're being very quiet. I know you have an opinion here. Uh, I'm just uh, uh, remembering all the scars that Chris is like reminding me of, such that I've posted a link to a line of code where I've spit out different scripts for a smoke testy ability to run something under Beehive, QEMU, or Zen, <laughs> because those are what I have within reach. So, Chris, if you find that helpful, great. As for something Sorry managerial. I can't see the darn forest from the trees at this point in these circles. So it's like, ah, just keep it coming. <laughs> so I hope you find that useful. Well, with all of the conversation that's occurred, um, just in case anything I happen to say may have been taken negatively, I think Beehive is a wonderful environment and FreeBSD provides some excellent tooling um, it is a question. It's always a question of taking that tech and being able to present it to upper management in such a way as they see it as a uh, a a beneficial target. Um, how does it how does it make their life easier? How does it save them money, uh, et cetera, et cetera? Fortunately, VMware will send them a new pricing sheet and it suddenly the beneficiality is turboed. Helps with the business case. But yeah, you know, we're it will let's see what takes place tomorrow, Chris, with our our parallel thinking compatriot in Tokyo who's done similar work to yours. I don't know to what degree you've looked at his code, but uh he, I did. Um, yep, the last I checked, more. I think he didn't. I didn't use. Uh, I, I believe he did, he's not using K events. He's actually, um, if I'm not mistaken, but I think that is one of the major differences, if I remember correctly, because I I believe I actually stumbled across the code previously before before I started VM State Oh, interesting. And I still started it because I figured, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna learn a crap ton from doing this, so. I'm just going to feel the pain and uh, let's see what is caused. Okay. And on that note, uh, none of you are excluded from attending that call. Just it was a weird sort of, uh-oh, he <laughs> the time zones are not in our favor. So we did our best to come up with a time that works for the three of us. So, uh, yeah, let's just, if anything, consider it introductions. But if you, any of you want to join, it's a, a, a reasonable time zone in the U.S. So sorry that you two have to pay the price. Maybe I, I missed the missed it what is this about so uh a, a gentleman in japan has produced bmd a a man management system a bit like chris uh, i space think process I, remember, supervisor. I remember you talking about you, you can yeah. just afford me an invite if i can if i can make it i'll try it's, to uh, if it, I, i'm not one 
too deep into calendars and sharing people's uh, email addresses. So the link is right there in the doc if you want to punch okay. it into your adjusted time zone and join. So uh, here is his page on that. And I believe it is in ports. Is that correct, Chris? It is in ports, yeah. Yeah, so is. hence the path there. So there's actually the wrong link in so yeah. far as it says utils, but I go to the GitHub, but whatever. Um, so John, I will drop that into chat once again for those who celebrate copy. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, yeah. And two levels of management. Okay. Uh, before we dive into, you know, fancy management topic, I say let's maybe call it there. And uh, some of you can join tomorrow, perhaps, and we'll just keep pushing this boulder along. I'll see if and I can it's not here. Not. Okay, first Andrew, then yeah. Chris. I was say, I'll see if I can pop in or not. We'll have to see. Cool. All right. Like and subscribe.